Pro is truly excited to be able to uh, kick off a conversation about inclusive recreation and sharing our success stories. I know with this many people on the call, it's going to be hard to share our success stories, so know that this is just the first opportunity that we will have to share and to network um, on this really important issue. So here's what we're going to cover today. I'm going to introduce our presenters. I'm going to uh, start by just defining what we mean by inclusive recreation. We'll look at the legislative framework. Uh, then I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, a representative from uh, the Government of Ontario to talk about the AODA. We have two representatives from Halton Region talking about municipal recreation, common challenges and solutions, and we're going to talk about uh, parasport opportunities, and then finally talk about what some next steps might be. So just to introduce everybody today, we have uh, with us from um, the Government of Ontario, Michael Awad. He is the Program Advisor in the Accessibility Policy Employment Strategy and Outreach Division of the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. Uh, the ministry is, implements the AODA um, and the Accessibility Outreach and Education Unit undertakes outreach and partnership projects to assist Ontario's organizations in complying with the AODA and the broader benefits of accessibility. My name is Diane English. I am the Director of Policy and Communications with PRO. I've been with PRO for about uh, 11 years and uh, look, I oversee a lot of the government relations that we do with PRO. Here from uh, the town of Oakville, we have Jennifer McPetrie. Um, Jennifer's been with uh, the town for about two and a half years and been in municipal recreation for over 16. She's the program supervisor for children, youth, and camps. Uh, Jennifer says that growing up with two siblings with disabilities, inclusion services were always really important and it's a topic she's very passionate and knowledgeable about. She's a BMST trainer and she oversees the inclusion portfolio for recreation and culture in the town of Oakville. And uh, Dave Sora, he, uh, Dave brings together his work with sports, equity, and human rights, social policy, and social innovation to help find ways for kids with disabilities to play. Uh, he has a long list of accomplishments and roles. Uh, currently, he is the co-lead of the Academy for Accessible Sports and All Abilities Program, Pickering Soccer, member of the Ontario Parasport Collective, and we're going to learn what that is. It's a really exciting collective, and the co-lead of the Participation Pathway Pillar under the Ontario Parasport Sport strategy. Uh, he's the Ontario ambassador for Jue, Jue, sorry, um, which is an app that helps pa parents find accessible programs across Can Canada. And uh, he's uh, for the past six years, he's been an advisor, crazy ideas guy for the School of Social Entrepreneurs of Ontario. And uh, finally, from uh, where's number four? There you are, from the town of Milton. We have Tammy Townsend. Having spent over 21 years in recreation, she's overseen a number of program areas, as you can imagine, arts, preschool, children, youth, inclusion, camps, fitness, volunteers, and older adults. That just about covers it all. Uh, she has a human services diploma from Sheridan College, College. She's also a graduate of the Parks and Recreation Management Certificate Program, which is a uh, uh, co-run by the Univers York University Schulich School of Business and Parks and Recreation Ontario. She's High Five certified in PHCD, PHA, and probably a bunch of other stuff as well. So thank you to all of our presenters today. And if you guys all just want to say hi. 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 <laughs> Thanks. So first of all, what do we mean by inclusive recreation? Here's a pretty, tech, I'd say a textbook definition. Inclusive recreation is, means that we're fully including persons with disabilities in regular recreation opportunities and facilities. And the goal here is often equitable access. And then we often hear about adapted or adaptive recreation, which is where a program itself has been modified to meet the needs of a specific group of participants. And that might be um, a camp uh, or a program that, that is, is not um, integrated, that where it's only for, um, uh, you know, for one specific group, or maybe it is integrated, like a sledge hockey uh, program that brings together both people who might might have mobility issues as well as fully able-bodied people. And as I like to say, we are all only temporarily able-bodied, so 
really inclusion means all of us. So let's just spend a moment talking about the legislative framework. And of course, this is specific to Ontario. I know we had a few people from across Canada um, uh, sign up for our webinar today. And that's fantastic. These are specific to Ontario. We have two pieces of legislation that are often come forward um, and are top of mind when we talk about inclusion, the Ontario Human Rights Code and the AODA. So the Human Rights Code in Ontario was established in 1962, I think it was the first one established in Canada, and it's administered by the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and um, it's an individual complaints-based legislation that addresses discrimination. The code requires organizations to accommodate people with disabilities to the point of undue hardship. That's always the challenge um, uh, to, to decide what undue hardship is. Um, and it protects people from discrimination, it covers five social areas, employment, housing, services, which is what we're talking about, union and vocational associations, and contracts. And there are 17 grounds um, for discrimination. I think we're all familiar with citizenship, race, place of origin, ethnic origin, color, ancestry, disability, age, creed, sex, pregnancy, family status, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression receipt of public assistance in housing and a record of offenses in employment. So there's several types of discrimination under the code. Direct discrimination is where um, a person would directly discriminate um, uh, uh, against another person. For example, a building manager refuses to rent an apartment uh, because he prefers to rent to someone of his own ethnic background. That's direct discrimination. Indirect discrimination is the, the the building, uh, the building manager says to the superintendent, uh, I don't want you to rent to anyone who isn't from my ethnic background um, or, um, you know, you're not going to rent to that group because their food smells too much. This is the example that they give on their website. <laughs> um, and so that, she, that person tells the other person what to do. That's indirect discrimination. And then constructive or adverse effect is, is a little bit more complicated. It's often unintentional. So the example that I found on the Ontario Human Rights uh, Commission website um, goes as follows. Um, it's, uh, uh, for example, an employer has a rule that employees are not allowed to wear hats or head coverings. The rule is not intended to exclude people who wear head coverings for religious reasons, but it may have that effect. And unless the employer can show that a change or exception to the rule would be too costly or create health or safety dangers, the employer should agree to change this rule. I think we're all pretty uh, familiar with that in terms of some of the, the work that had gone in, on in sport uh, related to wearing a hijab or other things, so it needs to be safe, um, but you can't discriminate on the, on the grounds of religion. Uh, recreational clubs and, and sport clubs uh, may also give services, um, it does allow for services um, that are not discrimination. So uh, different services or charges, fees based on sex, uh, marital status or family status, for example, um, special family rates at a community center or women only sections of a gym are permitted under the code. But there is still a need for equity. Um, within that. So if, if a group can prove that there is still not equity um, in a policy, then uh, they, are, they are open to having um, a claim brought against them uh, under the code. So there's lots and lots online uh, about this and examples, certainly lots of examples from the sport and recreation field on, on this. So now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Michael, who is going to talk more about the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Thank you. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar, and obviously to the, to the good folks at uh, Parks and Recreation Ontario who are uh, obviously very passionate about this and are, are, are making, you know, doing things like this to kind of bring that awareness. Uh, so in 2015, uh, sorry, 2005, the Government of Ontario passed the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act also known as the AODA. Its goal was obviously to make Ontario accessible by 2025 by creating and enforcing accessibility standards that address the areas of our daily living. 
The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act has five enforceable accessibility standards in place. The purpose of the standards is to foster the integration of accessibility into regular business planning. The standards apply to all sectors, public, not-for-profit, and private, that A, provide goods and services or facilitate directly to the public or to other businesses or organizations, B, have at least one employee in Ontario, and C, are provincially regulated. That means that they apply to all employers, from cities, schools and hospitals, to charities and businesses. The first standard to come into force was for accessible customer service. Next came the standards for information communications, employment, transportation, and then finally the design of public spaces. These standards are all under the umbrella of one Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation, or IASR for short. The IASR harmonizes common requirements across the five standards and also includes specific requirements for each. The approach to developing these standards was inclusive and consensus-based. Standards development committees involve people with disabilities. They made up actually more than half of the committee, half of the committee, and representatives of employer groups and economic sectors made up the other half. Ontario government ministry sat in as observers. Broad public consultation was also a major part of the development of the standards. I think I missed the slide there. So the fifth standard was the design of public spaces. This standard will improve accessibility on public spaces like playgrounds, public parking areas, recreational trails, and along sidewalks. There are seven areas relating to the design of public spaces, recreational trails and beach access routes, outdoor public use eating areas like those found at rest stops or picnic areas, outdoor play spaces like playgrounds and provincial parks and local communities, exterior passive travel like sidewalks, ramps, stairs, curbs, curb ramps, rest areas, and accessible pedestrian signals, accessible parking both on and off street, and service related elements like service counters, fixed queuing lines, and waiting areas. Accessibility standards for public spaces will only affect new construction and plan redevelopment that an organization is planning to maintain. Accessibility elements in buildings are addressed through Ontario's building code, which governs new construction and renovations in buildings. The IASR, as I mentioned, the Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation, affects our day-to-day -day lives in a myriad of ways that often go unnoticed. When we leave our house, we often need to get information to help plan our day weather updates, transit delays, on our, on our daily commute, our interaction with booth operators, bus drivers, stair ramps, and seating in our commute or finding a bathroom. And of course, in public spaces like service counters, trails, customer service areas, all the standards work together to ensure that persons with disabilities do not face barriers. And I'm gonna hand it back to you, Diane. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, and I just popped up a link to a guidebook that Parks and Recreation Ontario did with the support of, at that time, the Accessibility Directorate to help recreation providers understand the, um, uh, the design of public spaces and the requirements for uh, municipalities and other organizations there. So now over to Jennifer and Tammy to take us through some work that they are doing in Halton uh, Peel with uh, inclusion, um, an inclusion working group. Ladies? Thanks, Diane. Uh, good afternoon. Um, over the next few slides, Tammy and I will be uh, rotating back and forth talking about some of the uh, work that we and experiences that we've had in the Halton and Peel area. Uh, most of the information that we're sharing is just our experiences, and we're hoping that it will resonate with people and you'll continue the conversation with us to help build a larger support network and encourage policies and development of new standards or practices. So in Halton and Peel, we did create a working group. This was about a year and a half ago following a busy summer that we had here in Oakville with a few incidences involving our inclusion participants that involved um, escalated to staff injuries and even work refusals. Recognizing that these types of situations were growing more common, uh, we sought the support of our regional counterparts to start a working group to share best practices for intakes, behavior management policies, and create some common langu language among us. Uh, for example, as a reg regional team, we wanted to ensure that we were all speaking a similar language. Uh, so we even talked about changing uh, the words special needs and changing to inclusion in all of our print material. Um, we also thought it was important to have a peer support that we can connect with when faced with challenging situations. 
see how others would have uh, dealt with similar situations or how they would be advised to handle a similar situation in their municipality. Often our legal departments um, may advise differently based on uh, the municipality. We also know that many of our uh, clients or customers jump between municipalities for support and wanted to see where possible we could create similar processes. It's challenging for Oakville to say this child's needs are outside of our scope of what we can provide if a neighboring municipality is able to offer that same level of support that we've just said that we cannot. We also use this committee to determine gaps in our training and services where possible to work as a group to close those gaps and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the training section in the webinar. If you can switch to the next slide. Okay, so um, one area that um, we've all kind of found that we are doing similarly but we are experiencing some challenges is uh, through the intake process. Um, hi to everyone, by the way. I'm Tammy. <laughs> and um, so we found that some municipalities have uh, developed a standard intake process that helps them identify the level of support the participant will require. So when a family is registering for a program, um, we found that most organizations seem to um, just not ask for a formal diagnosis or they, they're not required to show proof of a, a formal diagnosis, just that their re child requires um, support at the point of registration. Some organizations have detailed forms that the families are required to complete in advance, in advance. and in Milton um, we have an All About Me package that um, is very comprehensive. It asks questions such as um, what the child's exceptionalities are, eating and toilet, toileting requirements, um, personal interests, do they enjoy going to the park, swimming, things like that. Um, how does the family wish for us to communicate with the child? Do they use an iPad? Um, things like that. And we can also discuss like IEP details. That's their independent educational plan. And medical conditions such as asthma and allergies. And once the forms are completed, they're returned to staff prior to meeting with staff and um, parents to determine the level of support that's required. Not everyone has a face-to-face -face meeting, but some will meet over um, the telephone. And this is where together the family and the staff decide the plan for integration. And there is a poll here that Ms. Diane is going to put up for us. So does your organization have a standard intake process? We're just interested in finding out more about that. So click away, people. Let, give us your opinions. We have, we have quite a few polls, so you've you got to be paying attention. There will be prizes at the end. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to give a shout out to our friends in Burlington who have a great example of um, where they've engaged with some experts, that being their local community living. Um, they, community living in their uh, municipality conduct the uh, intake interview with the families to decide the level of support the child re will require. And if the child support um, requirement is beyond what the City of Burlington's staff and training expertise are, then community living makes the call, not the city. So it's a very unbiased approach and relieves the pressure off the city, which um, I'm sure uh, they often you know, have some parents quite upset. And uh, it's yeah. just nice to know that someone else is making that decision. Um, and we're not the so experts. Like Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it looks like most people, most people have a an intake process, and so that might be one of the things that we want to start sharing. Following this is is what is your standard intake process, and we can share some of those best practices. Right. Sorry, okay. Tammy, back to you. No, that's okay. So as I was saying, we're not the experts, but parents um, expect a certain level of care, and and rightfully so. We're we're caring for their most prized possession, but it can be um, very stressful for both the parent and the child to go from consistent care throughout the school year to alternate care for um, two months. So it really disrupts the child's routine, which um, can be very difficult for a child with exceptionalities. Um, recreation, we generally attract young staff, so 14 plus years, and most come to us untrained and we provide the training, which Jen will get into in um, further detail. But um, parents with medically fragile children in the school system uh, have come to expect the same um, level of care that they receive in the schools um, from recreation providers. And um, sometimes we just can't um, care for their child the same way that the EAs and the certs do in the school. Um, and in some cases, we've been fortunate where we've been able to um, attract EAs to work in our summer programs and um, others were not able to. And, and right now, like in the Golden Horseshoe area anyways, um, we're anywhere from $15 to just shy of $18 an hour of kind of what the going pay rate is for a, an inclusion support worker. And, and that's currently less what, than what the um, school board is paying. We have another poll here.
So do, do you, you provide one-on-one -on -one support? Yeah. Great. It looks like a vote. Most people, yes, but some people no. And so yeah. that's great information for us because we can uh, then start to do some research into what supports are needed. If you do need to be able to provide that or if it's just not a need in your organization, that's great. Mm -hmm. So as I was mentioning earlier, when we can um, collaborate like with the customer um, early. It really does, with the intake interviews, it really does improve the overall experience for everyone involved. Um, we're finding that many organizations begin the intake process like immediately after registration opens up for summer camp, um, which has a number of benefits. This helps staff to develop a relationship with families, dive deeper into the information that's found on the intake forms, such as sharing the IEP, uh, really sitting down and discussing what the triggers are for their child and general strategies that they may use at home that would be beneficial at camp. And then there we can even chat about the possibility of a school visit. And it relieves stress on some families as this can be a major change um, for their child's routine as often some of them have never experienced a community program before and it just helps them to deepen their level of trust with staff. And it also assists us in managing our wait list, which um, ours are quite high in our municipality, and so um, it does help provide spaces for others. And then um, for various re reasons, we have participants that are in our programs that we're not always aware of that require support. And it does, um, like some families will just register because they have no other option for care within the summer. So it really does impact the program as we don't typically have staff that are able to support and it places pressure on our organizations as um, staff are often, you know, last minute trying to find support as we appreciate that the parents need care or, you know, we sometimes have some difficult conversations that we have to have about, you know, the families providing their own support for them to con continue in camp or exiting a child from the camp and just, you know, how they need to register in the future. And Depending what the uh, support requirement is, um, it can impact the other campers in the program as less attention is, um, you know, on the other children because the program leaders are dealing with the unidentified participant and it can impact the schedule for the day. So now we're off to Ms. Jen. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, so as Tammy's alluded to, um, one-on-one -on -one support can be quite expensive, uh, which can obviously take a toll on the financial impact for organizations. We know from working closely with our neighboring municipalities that there's inconsistency in how support is offered. Uh, some municipalities are able to offer one-to-one -one support at no cost to the family, just the cost of the program, where others offer a small premium for the service. Maybe it's an additional $20 or $50. Others charge um, half or the full cost of the worker for the week plus the charge of camp. So this could mean that one-on-one -on -one support in a camp program uh, can cost the family in the ballpark of $1,000 per week. Sorry, Diane, do you mind uh, flipping to the next slide? Sure. We, we just missed a couple of polls there on the last one. Oh, okay. Uh, so we're just going to do two, two quick polls just before we flip over. Um, uh, a quick question. Has your organization denied a customer from participating in your organ, uh, organ, uh, programs based on the support they require? Quick one. Good for us to know again. Thanks for helping us with our research. Great. All right, and I'll just quickly flip to the next one, which is how quickly do your inclusion in camps fill up and, and if you have a wait list. Um, so if you, we'll leave this one up for a second. You can actually type in your answers. Um, so this is a little bit different. And I know just while we're stopped here, Jay had asked uh, if uh, there was some funding available for one-on-one -on -one support. Um, and uh, Diane um, Weber uh, said that, yes, they've partnered with their local community living organization. Uh, Jay, I know there, there are lots of organizations um, that do partner with municipalities. Uh, I'm not sure who you, who you work for. Um, and maybe, I don't know if uh, Tammy or Jennifer, if you want to just uh, address that issue of funding for one-on-one -on -one support. 
Uh, so through our financial impact on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But more often than not, it is usually at um, the income of the municipality. So in our case, um, sometimes we're fortunate enough to receive grants to help support the cost of a worker, maybe through Canada Summer Works. Um, however, typically it is um, entirely the cost um, of the organization or in the mention that I said uh, that it could be the parents paying for some of the worker as well. Yeah, so it looks like most people, yeah, it fills up quickly. Um, they have wait lists. We don't have wait lists, but uh, so we'll share all these this information too with all the participants. So great. So getting back to, I think it's Jennifer who was talking about financial impact. Awesome. Thanks, Anne. Um, also, uh, some municipalities do not offer any one-on-one, as you saw in our other poll, uh, but sometimes there's an enhanced support. So smaller program ratios, maybe a one-to-four or one-to-six, and if they require one-to-one, -one, um, that has to be provided by the family at their expense. We know that from offering one-to-one -one from a municipality standpoint, it is costly and um, it's heavily subsidized by taxpayers and it's often, um, however, it's challenging to explain to a parent that we don't have enough funding to cover additional support staff. We'll often be told that you have the resources, you're the town, you can make this happen, uh, but that's not always the case. Obviously, like everyone, we have budget restrictions. Um, and from my experience, not providing a support person based on undue hardship is not something a municipality could ever claim. Um, in the case of a few years ago, we ended up um, providing two staff to one child uh, based on the needs of the participant. And when, you know, we kind of pushed back and had told the family, we need you to provide support, you know, times where they might start saying, well, we'll take this to human rights. So you kind of end up in a situation where you're, from a financial standpoint, let's just, you know, provide this person support and work through it and hopefully they can graduate to a point where they only need one-on-one -on -one support and maybe not two people. Um, we are interested uh, to know, uh, do you charge for one-on-one uh, -on -one support as one of our polls? So if you could let us know. And when I say charge, it's additional to the program, so not just the cost of the program, but maybe a $20 premium, $50, or the full cost. This is interesting because it actually looks like the majority of people don't charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a second poll which also asks, how many spaces do you allow? So do you offer one to five spaces? Um, most of the time we're talking about summer camp at this time. I know there are a few people that have mentioned along the side that you offer uh, support for programs throughout the year and other people do not. Um, so let's just talk summer at this point. Is it one to five spaces, six to 10, 11 to 12, more than 20, or you have no limit on how many spaces you can provide? That's great, thank you very much. Yeah, great. Are we into the next slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> great. So transitioning from schools to programs, um, as I was mentioning earlier, once school is out, parents really have minimal options for care. I can only speak really on behalf of our regional inclusion group, but um, families look to municipalities to supplement the care throughout the supper, summer months. So. Unfortunately, it's difficult for families to understand why we're only um, why we may not be able to provide the same type of care offered in schools, and why we only have minimal spaces available as well. And when we can't offer um, space for participants, um, some program uh, partic sorry parents are not willing to take no for an answer. So staff are typically met with tears or comments such as, I need to work and there's really no one else to care for my child or what else am I supposed to do? So it can be a very stressful time for everyone involved. Um, when we do have the opportunity to work with um, EAs, um, we can connect with the schools and learn more about participants um, requiring support. So it really does um, help to make it a smooth transition. Um, it's invaluable in creating a more inclusive experience, not only for the camper, but for everyone involved. And we're able to plan for the unexpected and deal with concerns as they arrive. Um, I know some of us in um, our region have uh, been fortunate to employ EAs in the summer, and it's been a tremendous asset because um, often these staff are, um, know some of these participants really well and how to deal with some of their challenges, or when unexpected challenges um, and behaviors come up, they're able to deal with them quickly based on their experience. And over to Jen.
How are you there, Jennifer? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so oh. <after> <laughs> Challenging summer in Oakville. Uh, we recognize uh, that there's certainly a training gap and that we could expand for our inclusion staff. Um, better equipping our staff um, for escalating incidences would help prevent staff injury and work refusals. Um, so through, our, through our working group, we determined that Peel has been offering some collaborative training for a few now, years now. It's a conference style where there's summer inclusion workers from a few municipalities, so Caledon and Brampton to name a few, come together for a one-day training session um, related to their summer positions, including like lifts and changing, sensitivity training, and more. Um, and this training has grown yearly, and they, now I last count, I think they had over 200 staff that attended um, this past year, and it's something that uh, we and Halton have talked about um, doing as well. It was also identified at our table that behavior management training would be beneficial across the board. Uh, there are different trainings available, so there's things like safe management, uh, CPI, and um, behavior management uh, systems training. And we as a committee reviewed and determined that the best training for our staff would be uh, BMS. Um, based on the content affordability and delivery, we were able to offer this to all our staff for just the cost of a workbook as long as we do have trainers on staff. In 2018, in Oakville, we trained over 60 inclusion staff and full-time staff in this training, and the feedback was fantastic. Staff alluded to feeling better about, uh, or better prepared for incidences and safer in their work environment, knowing that they had the tools and techniques that they could utilize. And prior to implementing BMS, staff are always told they had to be completely hands-off, and now we've explained to parents that our staff do have this training to de-escalate a situation should it arise to protect the staff and other participants and the individual themselves. Um, additional training that we've also offered to our inclusion staff is namely in-house, but includes uh, lifts and changing, feeding, adaptive activities, and appropriate language using PEC tools and so forth. There are some great training resources um, out. OFIA offers an excellent inclusion training, which I know um, both ourselves at Oakville and Milton had used last year. Erin Oak Co Kids is also offered to come in on multiple occasions and speak um, around children uh, with disabilities, uh, specifically autism. And um, I know many of you know about the Camps on Tracks program. We've had all of those at our, uh, as guests for our summer training with positive feedback from staff. In regards to training, unlike summer camp staff who require first aid and CPR and high five, or lifeguards who require NL, we don't have a minimum standard for inclusion workers. And although their position um, requires much more skill and expertise than a lot of our other camp uh, positions, so we'd be interested to maybe look at some sort of minimum standards that we put in place for inclusion uh, for staff working with participants with disabilities. And we do have a poll. So what type of training do you offer for your inclusion workers? Thanks. That's a great uh, summary of all of the uh, the training available. And uh, just uh, someone has put down uh, high five PHCD, and uh, there is there is um, a module that trainers high five trainers can take that was uh, actually developed by Dave Sora in in collaboration with Parks and Recreation Ontario that helps. Uh, um, deal with inclusion and accessibility uh, within the PHCD training. Uh, but there's tons and tons of good options here. So again, we'll be looking at uh, sharing some of these and finding links to them. Uh, I'm just going through. Can anyone explain what ROYR is? I believe that's the region of York. Oh, got it. <laughs> Thank you. OK. There's lots of acronyms. We are, we are a, a, a sector of acronyms. Great. Thank you very much. Back to Sammy. OK. So we find that uh, registration tends to decline um, once a child generally reaches 12 years of age. Um, parents are more comfortable with leaving their child at home. And so for a participant with exceptionalities who's not able to stay home alone, parents have minimum options um, for care. So the other concerns here is that there's a lack of opportunity for inclusion and um, care, and it becomes more of a care requirement versus a camp experience um, for parents at this time. And again, parents are looking to the municipality to provide this care. Um, Families are looking for care beyond 15 years of age as well, because there really are limited options. Most community living agencies do offer care, but they don't often have enough um, space to service all, or a parent does not wish for their child to be in a segregated program. They enjoy the more inclusive environment that they um, 
are accustomed to in recreation programs. Um, from what I understand, and I know in our area, very few municipalities offer adult day programs, and if they do, it typically begins after 21 years. But um, most, however, do offer opportunities for adults who provide their own support, support to participate in any um, program that we offer at no charge for the support worker. And these programs, though, only typically run for a very short duration, so a couple of hours each week. Um, and we also offer adaptive programs as well. And again, they're um, very short duration. And we have a poll here as well. Um, do you offer adult programming for inclusion participants? And if you do, please describe. I didn't get to the please describe. So if okay. you do have, if you, you do want to share to. that, <laughs> we have limited capacity here. Where uh, okay. you can you can definitely use the chat box um, to uh, to um, to put in any uh, types of programming if you want to describe. But you know what, we're going to do a follow up poll with you guys. So uh, we uh, we are really anxious and and excited to keep this conversation going. So oh, half and half, almost, yeah. All right, and we're back to Jen. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we just want to talk a little bit about the customer um, experience. Um, often I'm reminding parents that our staff are recreation staff and not personal support workers, so they have an idea of what to expect in regards to the level of training and support their child will receive while in our programs. However, we're still regularly seeing participants who have severe disabilities and our staff are, paying, are playing more of a personal support worker role with feeding and changing. I think most of us, when we started introducing one-on-one -on -one support role, had the idea that this would be more of a buddy to the participants and help keep them engaged in the programming. However, it's really evolved over the years, and many of us are unsure of how to say to these families that um, this is not respite, and we end up providing that type of care. Um, in Oakville, the only, we've only successfully told participants who are medically fragile that we cannot provide that level of support since our staff are not trained in this area. Um, this refers to any feeding tubes or medication given through injection, anything that's really outside of our scope. Um, at this point, any other type of disability um, has been a challenge for us to say that's you know, too challenging for us to take on. Often the higher needs participants are not fully integrated into our program at all or very minimally. They can be, um, they leave the group for breaks from the noise, um, they might go into a sensory room or take a nap or um, be fed in a quiet space. Some of these participants can spend the better part of a day away from the rest of the camp program. It's become a tough question, but what can we do to better adapt our programs and truly integrate these participants? We've come up far away over the last decade in terms of making sure that our programs are more inclusive, um, but again, when it comes to these higher uh, needs participants, how do we manage that as well? Um, often the participants may require a more support than the, just their own workers. So during a lift or a change, uh, they may have another staff that has to come away um, or if there's a high behavioral challenge. Um, this can leave our programs with less staff to run the program, affecting the regular scheduled activities or having to remove the larger group from a situation if it's unsafe. We've seen that in a couple of situations where, you know, if a child has now escalated their behavior and it requires a few staff, the rest of the group is, you know, leaving the group to kind of support that one child. Thinking about the big picture of camp and inclusion, it affects everyone. The staff in the program are often pulled away for support. The participants' day may be altered if the situation arises. And in the reality, we just need to ensure that we're providing the appropriate support to ensure that the rest of the program is just disrupted as little as possible. Thinking about, uh, again, where as a sector we've come, uh, we often accommodate individuals with high-functioning disabilities with no issues or and minor adaptions, um, and possibly without even one-on-one -on -one support. I know that m many of us municipalities have gotten to the point where, you know, we have one extra staff person in the program. It can actually, you know, support maybe two or three children who have very um, varying needs but very high-functioning who might just need a buddy here and there, or, you know, five minutes to cool down. And that's true integration where they're part of the group for, you know, 98% of the day, and they just need that extra support. Um, we, again, we've made major advancements on how we accommodate, and I'm hoping that we can keep this moving forward to ensure that we have proper supports, policies, procedures, and training to keep successfully offering inclusion services for the next 20 years. So question, uh, Paul, do you offer segregated programs? Coming up in a second. My apologies, Diane. I don't know why that one slipped. <laughs> no, it was it was me. Sorry, I forgot. To, and that's a yes or a no. All right, there you go. Sorry. 
It's so easy how fast you can do that. <laughs> if I was more tech savvy, it would have been up and ready to go. But uh, <laughs> I think I think you bring up an important point in in that is 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 you know at at um, the segregated program versus inclusion and what that means across your whole, all your services. is a really important discussion to have. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Thank you so much. Again, just a few more that uh, no rather than yes. Hmm. Great. And back to Tammy. Great. And finally, um, so as we mentioned earlier, in recreation, we're not the experts, and many staff that uh, are coming to us um, don't have that skill set either. Uh, we genuinely want to create an inclusive atmosphere and programs and positive experiences for all, but we're really struggling at times as it's not our um, expertise, and we've all kind of become very sensitive to the human rights issues. So Jen provided some great examples earlier um, of you know some of the um, parents that have concerns about why their child cannot be permitted into camp based on their needs, and. Um, you know, it also gets to the fine line where it's becoming healthcare, and, and that's beyond our scope. So, um, you know, we're also putting our staff at risk as well because um, the safety of them, some of the participants become very aggressive or tend to run. So it's, um, you know, that fine line, like when do we say, no, we can't have this um, child in our camp anymore. And for lack of a better word, like staff almost become very uncomfortable when it comes to, um, deciding whether or not the child will be accepted or if we have to exit a child from camp. Um, so as a sector, like we're, we're really, um, we don't really have any guiding legislation right now and the in, um, inclusion group that we have right now in, in Halton Peel, we're looking for consistency on how we approach all these services um, regarding inclusion and especially in the areas that we've highlighted today. So based on the number of people registered uh, today for this webinar, it seems like there's a lot of interest and others are feeling the same pressures as we are and would like to share and learn from others as well. So um, Diane had mentioned earlier that there's an opportunity at the forum where you can be part of the conversation as well. There'll be uh, um, opportunities to share together. I see um, someone had asked if I could share the All About Me package. We are more than happy to. And, I have to give a shout out to um, one of my coworkers, Amanda Rutina, because she really worked hard on that and um, has done an exceptional job on it. And I think um, a lot of people would, would benefit from that tool, so we're happy to share that. And um, I just wanted to include, too, that as much as we've highlighted many of the concerns um, today that we have, these participants and their families really truly do bring so much joy to our staff and our programs. And, you know, it's also really, um, rewarding for us to be able to see the impact that recreation, recreation has on the quality of their lives. And I know that's something Dave's going to get into in a few minutes as well and how um, we really are making them part of our community and, and they feel a sense of belonging. And I do want to thank um, Diane and Pro on behalf of our regional inclusion group for listening to us and providing this amazing opportunity today for others to engage um, in this conversation and keep it moving. So we also have... Uh, a poll that I think Diane has put up here. Do you have an inclusion policy within your organization? Yeah, we love policy. <laughs> we don't like creating them because we're the fun people. We want to. Yeah, yeah. We like I people like, like you, they're, Diane. They're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's always the policy wonk. That's great. And we have another poll. So I'll just hide this one and go to the next one, which is uh, here's another funding about qu uh, question about funding. Um, do you have access to another level of government um, that can provide support for inclusion participants? So that could be in Ontario. We're talking about region versus single tier municipality um, and other jurisdictions. Or if you're a nonprofit, um, you may have access to, I guess, grants and things like that. Um, and I know that I think we'd be interested in finding out what more about those. 
Jody made a good point that a lot of organizations um, have may not have a council approved policy, but they'll have guidelines. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in, in the in the in the world of of um, law, a guideline is as good as a council approved um, policy because it becomes a standard of care. And that's part of the the work that I think the Halton Peel Group has been focusing on is is what is that standard of of care, and where can we ensure that we're providing the best quality experience for everybody. Great. So not many have uh, um, have accepted. So I'll thank so much to uh, Jen and Tammy from Oakville and Milton for first of all kicking off this discussion. It was Tammy that reached out to us and or Jennifer. I can't remember which one of you. Both of you reached out to us to. Um, to start this conversation and get this going. And now it is my pleasure to uh, hide this poll um, and uh, invite Dave Sora to talk about Parasports and the Parasport Collective. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave. Um, this is very, very exciting. And, and, and thank you as well. I'd like to thank as well. Um, um, Tammy and Jennifer, and um, uh, for for starting this uh, conversation, um, I know that I'm involved in many many of these kinds of conversations, and uh, it seems that they just keep getting uh, more frequent. I'm not going to say more complicated, but certainly more interesting. Um, and and the, the two perspectives that I wanted to bring to this was. Uh, sort of, while well, it's two perspectives that, that are different in a way, uh, but on the same issue. Um, and so the two perspectives I'm bringing on Parasport, one is uh, from community sports um, out here in Pickering. Uh, we're just a very small soccer club, uh, relatively small. Um, a single sport, a single jurisdiction. Um, however, we've had in the last 12 years the opportunity to uh, really try and dive deep into uh, inclusion, accessibility, and adaptation in all different ways, shapes, and forms. Uh, we have the, you know, a great advantage here out in Pickering, as we've discovered over the last decade, uh, working very closely with, with a lot of partners, and particularly with the City of Pickering um, and Accessibility Advisory Committee, which uh, helps uh, keep us on track and gives us a 30,000-foot view, and with our local uh, Parks and Recreation, our Culture and Recreation Division, uh, they've been very um, influential and instrumental in, in, in shaping what we do and how we do our work at the local community level. Um, the other perspective is the provincial uh, perspective. It's a systems approach, which is Ontario Parasport Collective, which I will be talking about as well. Um, and they're two different approaches, or at least, although very common, similar issues, um, we come to it from different perspectives. And we are probably um, at the, what would you say, at the crossroads of, of you know, recreation, sports, um, children's health, rehabilitation, uh, research, uh, we, we just find ourselves often sort of in the middle of all that, and uh, very fortunately, and we try and uh, leverage everything we can get out of that. So maybe some of our experiences um, uh, in the last 12 years um, that have sort of created some success stories, if we think they're success stories and how, what we can share, I mean, maybe we can, you know, uh, uh, share them and, and, and support uh, um, other success. Okay, so change slide. All right, Dave, I put your slide into, right into the poll. Oh, we're, we just got a little feedback there. Um, the question so is a, to a poll, so yeah. Yeah, so maybe describe what, uh, where the results are going to come from. Um, so the, where, what was the origin of the, the, the poll that you are now polling our participants on? Yeah, so um, four or five years ago at, at a summit on uh, Parasport uh, survey conducted as part of the legacy area of the 2015 legacy uh, work out of the uh, Pan Am Games. And then it was a lot about sports and recreation, coaching, um, leadership in sport, and uh, a number of questions were about barriers uh, and about just pe what, what people were experiencing, what they were thinking about sector. Um, so, you know, we, we, we looked at different sectors, and this was one of them. Um, we asked uh, people, uh, did, uh, what, which of the following activities did sport and recreation, if you're in sport and recreation, do you think was the highest priority? Um, and these were the, the choices that were given. Um, and there are... All right, so now, yeah. 
Five by there thing? are five, and yep. Was, and then there was a number of different sectors. So uh, there was sport and recreation. There was health. There was uh, uh, rehabilitation, education. Um, there's a number of different sectors. So obviously, they will come from different perspectives on this. Uh, the, the reason I was asking this one, and it's not a poll, really, it's just a just a question to see how it aligns with um, with the sector today. Um, and that is exactly so. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, so just uh, so most people said that uh, providing recreational opportunities is the most uh, most important uh, thing for our sector. So if we then look at what the participants in 2014 said, yep, right on, right? Which is almost identical, um, which is for us on this side very um, compelling, uh, providing recreation opportunities. So that's not just the recreation sector, that's also the sports sector, recognizing the importance of recreational opportunity, not just sports and competition. Um, so that was very um, important, uh, and what, what that poll just told us it probably is that it's, 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 it's still consistently the same priority for everyone, which to us, and when I talk about the um, Parasport Collective, um, uh, it points a finger in a way to uh, the importance, or highlights, I should say, um, the importance of uh, recreation, uh, municipal recreation in all our communities. Great. Next slide. Yes. Sweet. So I'm sure many of you know, um, are familiar with a lot of the uh, statistics. Um, we're not sure that there's, that we have, you know, um, great data. It comes from different, you know, in different forms and shapes, and there's all different types of data that we have. But the bottom line, there are two bottom lines here in blue. Um, you know, obviously a significant amount of Canadian degrees, you know, participating in sports is, is very important. I mean, I, I think everybody has agreed with that. The other bullets in, in, in black uh, are just a number, and we probably have about 30 I could have put here um, from all different sources, um, and they continue today into 2019 to just keep generating and replicating numbers. Um, but the, you know, the, the bottom line is that you know, everyone recognizes the importance of sport and recreation and play um, and activity. Yet, uh, when you look at all the numbers, um, and I, I typically focus on children, um, as you can see here, um, most of the kids with disabilities just aren't playing, um, and, and that's they, they remain on the sidelines. Um, so that's why the focus of our program in the uh, academy and the ability all abilities program, and um, one of the pillars in the sport uh, in the uh, um, uh, Ontario Parasport Collective is on the grassroots and the ability to tap into and, and mobilize the, the kids at the grassroots. One of the one of the most important, I think. Uh, uh, statistics is the one at the bottom that 53% uh, of children with a, with a disability have no friends. Um, that is significant and it's striking and it's something that we always keep in our mind and we actually have that written down on a whiteboard in our room so that we always remember that. Um, it's not just about uh, physical activity, it's about social activity as well. Next slide. Wow, that's an amazing. Did you want to do the next poll then? The uh, the health and rehab sector? Sure. Excellent. All right, so same, same. Um, it's really uh, the same. Yeah, it's the same, so the, but from the point of the health and rehab sector, what do you think they perceived as the most important thing um, in, in uh, this? So, So if, if you said providing recreational opportunities, think about if you're in the health and rehab sector. We'll see if you guys are right. So if we then go to what they said, <coughs> they said the most important thing was providing those links. So do you want to talk a bit about that, Dave? Yeah, well, in, in the uh, rehab sector, uh, particularly that we work with um, in the children's rehabilitation centers, uh, probably its priority is to is to um, get the children um, out of the rehabilitation and, and integrated fully into the community. Um, so therefore, it, it's not surprising that their priority is to uh, for them to find connections um, to um, to programs uh, in the community. And that again, that now points to programs like our own in in, in community sports. Um, and other nonprofits, but also and, and significantly in municipal recreation. 
Um, so, and we know, and we work with them uh, weekly uh, with two different um, rehab children's rehabilitation centers, and uh, we struggle. Um, it is one of the barriers that we know of uh, in the community, the inability to, or the limited number of programs in the community, and therefore, you know, as a nonprofit sector uh, struggles to create um, uh, programs and to sustain them. Probably seven of ten, eight of ten are gone within one cycle, uh, within a year. Um, Special Olympics is, is, is probably has a similar um, churn rate. Uh, programs come and go, um, and that creates uh, challenges and barriers for parents. Um, and again, that's why this is important because the health and rehab sector um, looks at um, um, priorities a little bit differently than does the sport and re uh, recreation sector, but both in a way point towards um, uh, municipal recreation and the importance of it. Um, and I guess the importance of how, and I will be talking about that, and collaborations uh, among the community. Because obviously, uh, the more health and rehab and the more sports look towards municipal recreation, it's just another form and source that placed on municipal recreation and demand. Um, so uh, we certainly, from our perspective, uh, look at it. And I know in talking with uh, um, the staff at uh, the City of Pickering's Rec and uh, in their uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee, we're often talking about, you know, sort of what is the link uh, between here and there and, um, you know, how do we create those pathways. And that is something we're, you know, I will be eventually be talking about, about the uh, Parasport Collective as well. Uh, next slide. You know, we have one more poll. This is your last poll, people. So this one, it talks about um, uh, the removal of which barriers has the highest impact on participation. Here it is. And then we're going to let you know what the respondents in 2014 said. So what do you think? Is it lack of awareness, lack of accessible facilities, lack of opportunity, lack of coaches, lack of disability knowledge? And think, uh, you know, this is all kinds of people responding. And when we talk about barriers, we often talk about them from the supply and the demand side. So we know that there are lots of barriers that the families face, and there are lots of barriers that organizations face. And so that's some of the work that we're going to be looking at, is those organizational barriers um, and how we can, we can remove some of those so that, in turn, those barriers that participants face get addressed. So everyone's saying lack of awareness is the most, imp uh, the most um, would have the biggest uh, impact on participation if people were more aware of what's available. Uh, so, um, and then followed by lack of opportunities. All right, if we go back here, we'll look. And it was actually lack of opportunities and then lack of awareness was the, the results of the survey that uh, Dave is reporting on. So similar. Um, and as I, as I said, we think about it from both the participant side and from the organizational side. Well, yes, what's interesting, I think, about that, I mean, certainly the, the one and two, I know that um, you know, lack of awareness is, is often identified as a number one barrier. Where the parents particularly just don't know what's out there. Um, but it's interesting because, uh, you know, there has to be something out there to know about. And so it's lack of opportunity, but it's chicken and egg, too, because if you don't know about something, um, you know, there isn't an opportunity. But second, what's, what's interesting about, you know, the high-impact barrier here is that intuitively, to some degree, you know, many people would say uh, lack of accessible facilities. And maybe it's in the last 10 years we've gotten a lot better at, at uh, creating uh, or improving access, uh, physical access. Um, however, and I know everybody talks, a lot, or, or many people talk about, and we do too, about funding and resources and, um, you know, where do we get the money to, to uh, improve participate, increase participation, improve access um, and inclusion. Uh, when, when you look at most of the, a lot of the funding, it's going to uh, improve accessible uh, buildings and facilities as opposed to programs. Um, so um, a lot of the funding isn't going to create, create isn't going towards creating new opportunities, but rather to creating uh, more accessible facilities. Um, and in the end, what happens is we may have, you know, a society of, of a tremendously accessible um, um, sport recreation facilities and all facilities, um, yet no one to program them or not high quality programming. So that's, that was, was particularly interesting out of that survey, of that question. Thank you. Um, 
So I just want to talk very quickly about uh, the work we do at the community level. Um, um, we, it's called, we call it the Academy for Accessible Sport. What people mostly know us uh, for or for, by is the All Abilities Program. So we sort of figure in our heads that we have two sort of components. One is the program itself. Um, uh, our goal is fun, friends, and fitness for kids with disabilities. And uh, we focus in three areas on um, building and designing and delivering programs. Um, and I know we just there was a poll just now on um, segregated programs, and we apply what's called the inclusion uh, spectrum. So we design programs around a wheel that range from fully inclusive all the way around to fully segregated. Um, the, 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 the goal is to, our goal anyway that we think is to provide parents with as much choice as possible for the nature and type of programming they want. Um, it's challenging. We can end up with, you know, two parents or two kids over here wanting this and, you know, seven over here and four. Um, and what we try to do is even within our design, within a, you know, a one-hour field design to incorporate different types of programming. Um, it gets a little bit complicated, but uh, we've been playing around with it. Um, so program design delivery is one. Uh, training is something else that we recognize that there's a need for, so we kind of have developed what we can with who we can. Uh, we have had the luxury of working with some extraordinary partners um, in the development of training. Um, uh, we, we, we've worked with, and I think uh, uh, Diane mentioned, I mean, we worked with High Five. Uh, we've worked with um, uh, uh, OCAD's Inclusive Design Research Center on, on inclusive innovation uh, to develop training. Uh, we've worked with Sick Kids and Hinks Delcrest um, on tra developing anxiety training for our coaches and volunteers, Surrey Place. Um, on using PECs and understanding uh, ASD, uh, the Durham District School Board and the Catholic School Boards on um, inclusion and ASD, um, Sport for Life, um, a great partner. Uh, we work with them on, on uh, physical literacy and adapted physical literacy and its newer tool on um, uh, uh, that it just created uh, play tools and adapted play tools for measuring um, for, for, for measuring uh, development and growth of children with disabilities um, in, in, physical, in physical activities. Um, so we focused a little bit on training. That's our second component of what we do. And third, we do some community capacity building. So we go out and take what we've learned and actually take it out to other communities. Our focus has mostly been on uh, going out to other sports, uh, not just within soccer, but within other sports, um, and uh, training them, providing them with all the tools, resources, session plans, everything we can to help them start a program, and a, a, a program for all kids of all abilities. Um, as you can see there, our, our program, um, we, it is all abilities. We're not um, focusing on one type of disability, mobility, cognitive, intellectual. Um, it's all abilities. <clears throat> we focus on five to, ages 5 to 18. We've been pressed on the 18 plus side. I know that um, in the earlier presentation, Jennifer and Tammy were talking about aging out. Uh, we know that and we see that, and it's a huge challenge for us as, as our kids you know, grow with us for seven years, um, and then eventually uh, they get to 18, uh, they no longer have similar funding um, to stay in programs, costs increase for them. Uh, we are more trained at the, you know, at the, ch at the early years and at the elementary school, school age level, so we have to bring new training in. Uh, there's a whole bunch of issues that come up, but we so but that's where we, we our program is mostly at um, five to eighteen, a little bit of eighteen plus. We're being pressed now into the um, uh, preschool age three to four, and we operate in three sites. Or um, in Pickering, we work um, at Holland Bloorview Children's Rehab, and we do work with uh, Grandview Children's Center in Oshawa. Um, and, and as part of that, and I mentioned a lot of the stuff just below there that the academy, the academy is is the other stuff that we do. Um, I put there building sector capacity. It's just that it's a space uh, we recognize that program delivery just isn't enough. Um, in order to, in, uh, or maybe in order to be able to deliver good programs, we need to be doing other stuff. Um, one of the things we've been working on was, in, was innovation um, and looking at innovation and how innovation can influence and impact um, inclusive recreation and sport and play. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we're looking at there. Um, the first involvement and quality participation guideline, and there's a little picture of it up there on the right. Um, we developed that as a, as a, as a 
practice tool for soccer clubs, and, and we, we got to uh, eventually adapt it for other sport, but it's to um, address the concept of first involvement that was, uh, that was uh, raised by uh, Sport for Life and quality participation, and how do we actually create quality participation uh, for children. It's not just creating great first experiences. How do we continue to get them to come back? It's the whole concept of play and stay. Um, and with children with disabilities and parents, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, all the issues that, ta that Tammy and um, Jennifer identified <clears throat> um, in delivery of, of programming for kids with disabilities, um, they all have direct impact on whether um, a child plays and whether they stay. And uh, then it's then it's about uh, you know lifelong play and activity and how do we actually do that? So we look at that and how we can uh, we take it apart and try to put it back together. Um, so that's one part of what we do in the academy. We do some research on our own. We work with um, five or six universities on collab research collaborations. We do some of the um, you know. Uh, research um, sort of on the field, so they might, uh, many researchers might want to come to our, our field and uh, apply a methodology to what we're doing. Um, and then third, we have a community of practice and, and shifted uh, from a community of practice of a bunch, a whole bunch of people sort of locally um, working on um, how do we you know, get kids playing locally um, to a collective impact project, um, which is a little bit different. Um, in order to, it was a little bit bigger than just how do we get kids playing, it's how do we uh, increase participation rates, how do we um, overcome barriers, how do we make uh, sport and recreation just more accessible to children um, with disabilities. Um, okay, next slide. Great. Yeah, uh, we, sorry, Dave, I just want to say we, we are going to go past our, it's already 1.07, we're going to go past our time, so I want to make sure, Dave, you can get all your, your slides in, so just uh, conscious of our, t of our time now. I'll go, uh, I'll talk a lot faster. <laughs> no, don't talk any faster. <laughs> it's great stuff that you're sharing, and as you're talking, I'm popping up resources, uh, links to the resources that you're talking about as well, so okay. carry on. Thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, we're to, this is about success and about sharing success. Um, and one of the things we always think about is, you know, what is success? What we do know is that um, it's same. Uh, success and indicators of success are the same um, for typically developing kids as they are for children with disabilities. Uh, but sometimes they're different. Um, there's different needs and expectations. We know that, uh, you know, we're focusing on kids, but, and I think as it was earlier identified, um, we look probably we talk about this, probably 51% of our focus is on the parents um, and then the, ch the child. Um, and there are needs and expectations of the community as well. Um, the kids, as we talk about, have very unique barriers and challenges. And I think that was expressed earlier from severity, well, from type of, of ability, disability, and limitation um, to their very specific um, needs. Uh, we've all, we often hear, you know, you, you've uh, met and worked with one child with uh, on the autism spectrum disorder, and you've only worked with one. You haven't met them all. There's only one. Uh, it's only one. Um, we know then that you know there are different expectations, needs, um, of each child, of each parent, of the community. Um, different sectors of the community expect different things of us. Um, and then, so how do we measure success? Um, typically, in sport, we're looking at you know skill or perhaps score. Um, with children with disability, we're looking at a whole range of um, outcomes and ways to measure success. Um, the, the adapted play tools was one way to evaluate um, development and growth, um, age graded. Um, and we also, though, look at the other end because we're talking not just about physical outcomes, we're also talking about social outcomes. So for us, sometimes uh, success is, you know, <clears throat> Um, a, a new friend, uh, being part of a group, um, even simple things like being off the sideline uh, more than once, being picked for a team, and the, not the last person. I'm sure you've heard of all these things, but these are real measures, um, indicators of success at the very individual level. Um, you know, uh, that a child and a parent come back more than three times or six times or, or in the summer and the winter. I mean, those are huge indicators of success. Um, and particularly indicators for long-term participation and engagement. Um, so we have to figure out sometimes what are our indicators of success. If we want to share them, we have to sort of know what they are. 
Um, we've been exploring lately the concept of quality participation and the idea that there are foundational strategies. There are three strategies, um, uh, program strategies, uh, physical envir and environmental strategies. Um, and there are six building blocks that, that, that contribute to the, the quality of one's participation. And so this is what we're looking at, trying to figure out at the front end what is success. It's more than them just coming. It's more than them just playing. So we're looking now at the quality of play and what it looks like and how do we measure that. Next slide, please. Um, you know, so we do, like everyone else, probably share or we think we share what we've done. Um, I think we all, every time we sit down, we always, you know, go, oh, we forgot to do that or forgot to do that or tell that um, or share that. I mean, we probably use the traditional methods of sharing, you know, what we think are successes. We do it in-house within our club. Uh, we use local, um, local and social media when and where we can. Um, athlete to athlete and athlete to parent, there's a picture there of one of our athletes um, sharing his uh, success um, at the Special Olympics recently with five gold medals. Um, we share with other clubs and sports primarily through training, as we mentioned. Um, as, a, as, we talk, as, we, as I start to talk about the, um, the collective, we also <coughs> share um, success through our ambassadors. So there are parasport ambassadors who uh, then go out uh, into the community and share uh, what they've learned, what they've done, um, that kind of thing. So I think these are probably common everyday uh, ways to share success, but uh, as we recognize our you know, there's tons of room for improvement um, in our work. Next slide. Um, one of the things through our collective that we started to learn, I mean, we did, we did talk about that because it's sort of a chicken and egg, um, just like opportunities and awareness, you know. We f came to a point where it's like, okay, we're, we think we're doing good stuff, but then if we're not telling it, then no one knows. And if no one knows, then, you know, what good is it? Um, we also recognize that in developing stories, we have, a, we have a responsibility to shape stories. It's not just by creating opportunities, it's by actually shaping opportunities and outcomes. So we ended up sort of crafting this sort of a cycle where, you know, one, we'd create opportunities, we'd then capture the outcomes and successes, then we'd share them. That's probably the standard, you know, three-step way of doing it. Then we looked at, you know, once we shared it, we'd get imp input. Um, and try and figure out how to optimize it. That's where the collective comes in um, and all the people involved and, you know, how else could we have done it? The collaboration is to, is to explore with other community groups. And again, this is where, you know, all our partners are, are hugely uh, impactful. How to take that um, thing we did, the opportunity, um, the outcome, and how do we, now that we optimize it, how do we now build it out and make it even better? Um, and that's where innovation comes in. So we've now taken these outcomes to an innovation process so we can try and scale, magnify, re or, or change or duplicate outcomes. And then we, re we recreate, we create, recreate, or co-create um, new opportunities. So we're trying to, we've been playing with this cycle lately on, so it's called nurturing and telling stories. So we know in order to have success, um, it's not just about getting out there and, and uh, doing stuff. At one level, it is. But at another level, it's about, um, you know, sort of some thoughtful, um, 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 some thinking about what we do and how we do it and trying to figure out how we can optimize, maximize, and leverage everything we have um, so that we can um, value add at the end. So this is just sort of a way that we've been looking at this lately. Uh, next slide. So this is sort of the segue into our work with the, uh, the Parasport Collective. Um, so on the left in green, you see the Para Ontario Parasport Strategy that is led by the Collective. On the right, there's a Sport for Life and OFIA, which was mentioned earlier. It's another Collective Impact Project. Um, and our Academy, which was a... So these are three Collective Impact Projects that were going on at the same time. Um, so what happened was um, the Parasport uh, Collective... Um, Sorry, the Sport for Life and OFIA merged into one collective, um, as it was two separate ones. And then the academy that we, that we led out here in Durham Region uh, with the City of Pickering and the Accessibility Advisory Committee, uh, we rolled that underneath the Parasport strategy to 
give it more focus on the grassroots, on the, on the beginning part of the pathway. So we folded our project and rolled it into the Parasport strategy. So you can see these are three um, larger uh, collective uh, or collaborative issue, initiatives looking at, co at a common area, the centers, children and youth. Uh, the Parasport strategy was looking at sports and athlete focus. Um, the Sport for Life in Ophia was looking at physical literacy of students and within school <coughs> and increasing activity in the school day. And then ours was on uh, grassroots entry and quality of participation. Uh, next slide. So uh, I guess as, as, a, as a segue to that, um, in our research we had, we had identified, and I know Diane had mentioned uh, supply demand. Uh, there's an everyone plays from PRO uh, a report back in 2006, over 10 years ago, but it was a framework for us to look at uh, what we were doing. Um, it was intended to look at low-income Ontarians, um, as you can see below. Uh, but what we identified in using that framework was that in policy, in inclusion policy, there was a lot miss. Or sorry, in the um, in the policy framework, there were parts missing in it um, on the actual language of policy and on the demand side, on the parent community side, um, there's a, there, there was absences and gaps that were very specific to saying that this is what, um, here's our policy on you know, what we can do and how we will do it, et cetera. On the supply side, which in this case would be municipalities, um, there was an, an alignment of national, provincial, um, and even regional sport policies, parasport policies, the absence of specific council direction or policy and authority um, to deliver and support um, inclusive recreation at the time. Um, so there's a number of um, uh, absences on the, on the supply side that we detected. And so what we've been doing from both the, uh, the community side, from the um, academy, and now as we bring it into the, um, uh, the collective, where we can look at or we, we know that there are supply and demand side um, issues. Um, in policy that we can now explore. So that was just the point of this is to say that you know a lot of our, we've been informed by sort of the PRO's work um, 10 years ago and sort of shaping or giving us a framework to look at what we're doing now. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a quick, I'll just quickly give you the introduction to the Parasport Collective. The Collective was a, a product of the um, a legacy piece from the uh, 2015 uh, Pan Am Games. Um, it has a, it's a, uh, has a about 32 members, I believe now, um, primarily from sport in, across Ontario, um, a number of universities um, and some nonprofit organizations. Um, there, the focus is on uh, quality of physical activity and sport experience for Ontarians with disability. Um, and the real goal and the mission here is to, based on what, that last slide about on alignment, is to really align the, all parts of the parasport system um, across different sectors. So that's sort of the vision and mission of what we do. Uh, next slide. We're uh, broken up into four different action areas, um, para pathway development, hosting and competition, leadership and education. Um, they each have goals, priorities, and key success indicators. Um, in the orange on the left is the pathway development um, that uh, I co-lead. Um, this is sort of the, the, uh, the earlier collective impact project um, that we were leading under the academy was now mostly this. It's the pathway development, which is grassroots. So we are looking to develop um, a roadmap um, uh, from sort of cr grassroots right to podium, but the focus, one of the focuses is particularly on grassroots participation. Next slide. So in the um, grassroots participation pathway, uh, there are four, uh, three, sorry, three focus areas, participation, the parapathway development, Ontario excellence. Those are the sort of, if you think of a pathway from grassroots to, to podium, those are the three uh, pieces of it. Ontario excellence is right to the podium. Um, within the participation pathway, we're looking at three specific areas, awareness and first involvement, which I spoke about earlier and what the surveys were telling us. Um, it's about knowing about how do we get people to know what's out there and how do we make great experiences. <coughs> how do we, secondly, how do we um, create opportunities for uh, grassroots uh, participation at the community level? And then third, and uh, th there was a, I know there was a slide earlier about transition. Um, uh, how do we 
uh, transition from the community to sport and from sport to community. So it's a, it's a circular relationship. So these are the three priority areas that we are working on within the one um, stream of, of uh, pathway. This is the, um, uh, just last year, um, this was introduced as a framework for looking at uh, some of the work. Um, it, it's quality participation is an end, I, I suppose is an end goal. Um, and it came from the uh, uh, CDPP, which is the uh, Canadian Disability Participation Project. Um, they created a blueprint for building quality participation in sport, children, youth, and adults with a disability. It's a framework that allows us now, what we're trying to do um, is put everything into here and see how this really works. Can we create quality participation um, uh, of a child with a disability and, and their families, their parents, et cetera? So it's got the three foundational strategies. So we need to consider physical environment, program environment, social environment. And then there are six building blocks, uh, belonging, autonomy, mastery, challenge, engagement, and meaning. And the idea is that if you can um, uh, build our pro, if we build our programs um, on these blocks, that we should result in quality experience and then quality participation, which then equals, hopefully, a lifelong participation. Um, so this is sort of the framework now that we, from the academy and in the within the um, um, Parasport Collective, are starting to look at is, is how we can build all our work at the grassroots and, and through the pathway. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so, you know, how, I, I guess, and this was about, um, you know, sharing and supporting and working together. Um, and I know that we've worked, like I said, I keep saying this, we work very closely here in Pickering with the municipality, with the recreation, and with the Accessible Advisory Committee. Um, so on the Parasport Collective, one of the very specific things that we're looking at right now um, on the pathway um, is a transition to community sports. And uh, how do we do it? Um, how do we so, and what supports can we provide to municipal recreation? Are there things like joint training, collaborative training, capacity building? One of the things we are going to be doing is community asset mapping and building and seeing, you know, what assets are out there, um, who's got what, how can we support each other? So we want to map everything out there. So that's one uh, way to, I guess, to uh, connect with the Parasport Collective is through this pathway work. Um, for anybody on this conversation who is um, uh, around in Ontario, certainly there's participation potentially on the Parasport Collective itself, participation on the Pathways Group, which is the group we lead. Um, if anyone wants to you know, become a member um, to help inform what we do. Um, we also will be doing consultation, a bunch of surveys. So those are different ways to participate um, on the collective or to, to provide input. Um, there's a bunch of co-development opportunities that we think may be coming down in the future. Uh, for example, in training, and training keeps being talked about. Um, and it's not just training uh, in sport. I mean, we're talking about, you know, with all the different partners that we work with in children's rehabilitation, children's health, um, sport, recreation. Um, so there's a, a bunch of different opportunities possibly coming up to uh, co-develop products that can help um, improve the pathway or connect the pathway, particularly at the, at the, at the front end. Um, so that may be able to address some of the issues or we can explore issues that were raised in, uh, in municipal recreation. Um, in the academy, uh, certainly the one thing, I mean, we've been doing a number of things. We've been exploring with different ways to uh, increase participation um, and get to parents and children. Um, so we've started a central collection of grassroots success stories. We've, been, we've created a children's story. We're looking at a, the possibility of creating a series of children's stories on inclusive um, play, um, uh, stories that you can, uh, you know, a parent can lie in bed and read to their children. Um, it it, it, it um, has children with disabilities in it. It talks about issues, um, how do we play, where do we play, that kind of thing. Um, we've been talking about uh, making sample TV commercials. I'm sure you've seen a number of the commercials right now. There's one on Subaru out. There's one, there's a Canadian Tire Jumpstart one called Wheels. Uh, we've been talking about um, uh, the other end of it, which is just creating uh, mock commercials um, that, ha that include uh, kids with disabilities in them for any random product and then send it to the, uh, to the, to the corporation or manufacturer as an idea. The one place certainly where, uh, or two places where, where uh, there could be some involvement or collaboration with uh, recreation is in the area of inclusive innovation and in community solutions incubators. Um, we've been talking about ways to, you know, very local uh, and regional ways to get together and to 
uh, it's not collective impact and it's not really community practice. It is about innovation. It's about sitting together and finding uh, it's solutions focused and issues focused. <laughs> and it's a bunch of different sectors coming together to find solutions. So we're, we're designing the incubators now. All we're doing is, is borrowing from the current uh, trend in social innovation and entrepreneurship from its processes and bringing it to recreation, sport, and play. So there's a possibility of, of uh, collaboration there uh, to create um, um, successes. Uh, we did do, I mentioned that guide uh, to first involvement in quality participation. That was intended for soccer and it's going to, hopefully we're going to revise it for to be adapted for other sport. It can also be adapted for municipal recreation and go hand in hand with the, uh, that uh, inclusive supplementary to um, high five. <laughs> There's just a lot of opportunities, I think, um, whether it's the Power Sport Collective or the Academy, and I blur the lines a lot now, um, but for engagement with uh, municipal recreation, I know that the, on the collective, um, on all the pillars, um, municipal, the, the quote-unquote municipal recreation and PRO continues to come up, and, and uh, I think that um, I think there's 100% um, support to have uh, much more representation or input from the recreation, the municipal recreation sector. Um, there's a recognition from the collective and from the, on our academy and in sport general that um, uh, greater um, co uh, connectivity and collaboration and joint projects uh, or joint approaches um, to um, inclusion from the different sectors, and these are related sectors, um, creating opportunities to work together more um, are, are very welcome, and I think that the uh, collective is certainly looking for that. And like I said, in the above part, you know, whether it's on the, the, the OPC itself, on the Pathways Group, or even consultation, there's different ways to become involved and to inform and to work more collaboratively. Um, there's other uh, other ways. I mean, certainly we do a number of presentations and conferences that um, that certainly municipal recreation and PRO. We'd love to work together with you. Um, there's partnerships in research and knowledge mobilization. Uh, we do a lot of piloting with um, and testing with uh, uh, in research, and there's uh, room to work a lot with municipalities and, and uh, recreation programming. And then the one I've got highlighted there in blue is populated navigation tools, which is um, uh, the idea of you know parents need to know what is where in order to uh, create great stories and successes. They need to know what's there. So next slide, please. Um, the Jue app, um, sharing starts with knowing, so, you know, if we're talking about sharing successes, um, you know, the, the limitations, you know, parents don't know what's out there, there's not enough programs out there, there's a hundred barriers to parents. Um, one of the things is, uh, there, is a, there is a tool, the Jue tool, and I just posted it there, you can get it online, it's free. It's just an app, uh, GPS-based, and allows you to connect uh, um, from wherever you're standing within uh, 50 or 100 kilometers of where you are to any arts, camps, sports, or other types of programs um, that are offered um, that are inclusive or adapted. Um, so you just use that app to connect. Um, one of the one of the sub projects I've been working now with Special Olympics to in Ontario to see if we can uh, populate this app. Um, through sports under the sports tab with all the Special Olympics programs. Um, similarly, it would be great to populate this app with all the municipal recreation programs um, that are accessible, adapted, inclusive, etc. to be put into here that parents anywhere can find it. Even when they're on vacation, it could be Muskoka, they could hit the app and they would find it, whatever's there. They could go to a day camp, they could go to a day program, a drop-in program that's inclusive or adapted. So this is another um, little project that uh, you know, we could all work together on, which is uh, populating this app. But again, it just starts with uh, um, information and, and, and connecting some of the pieces together, and this is one tool for doing that. Uh, next slide. And that, you are done, my friends. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so thank you so much, yeah. Um, Thanks, Dave. And, and as you said, this is just the beginning of the discussion. We really have only been talking about the possibility of, of how we can collaborate and, and, uh, and how recreation and, and the work that's going on in Parasport Collective might, might benefit municipal recreation and vice versa. And I think, uh, I think it was uh, on our first call before this uh, webinar, uh, either Jennifer or, or Tammy said, well, now we've got Dave on speed dial. Um, so 
I think yeah, I just want to, again, thank our presenter city. We are a little bit over, so I will just quickly um, thank everyone, Dave Sora, Jennifer McPetrie, Michael Aved, uh, and uh, Tammy Townsend for joining us today. Recording will be available of this along with, I know some people had uh, trouble under, uh, hearing Michael's presentation. Well, I'll get his notes from his presentation as well. Uh, we'll be sending out a post-event survey um, as well as asking you more questions. Uh, and along with the links that I've shared here in the chat box and that Jennifer shared in the chat box, we're going to be having an open discussion on uh, two, actually, sessions that really focus on this at the forum as well as a Camps on Track presentation. So if you haven't registered, Jennifer says, early bird deadline is tomorrow, uh, so register uh, for the pro forum. You can join our conversation. And uh, we will be launching an online community where we can start to share resources and talk about this. So stay tuned for that for pro members. Um, and uh, if you have any ideas about how you'd like to see um, to see pro or uh, move forward, you can always contact me. And uh, if you have specific questions for any of our presenters, I'd be happy to pass those on as well to our presenters. And just quick. Quick, I'm going to just do a quick poll. Would you like to have more opportunities to share stories and resources on the topics of inclusive recreation? I'm pretty sure everybody's going to say yes. I hope so. And then I have another poll. I'll put, is how did you hear about us today? Uh, just if we could have a quick poll on that. And again, thanks, everybody. I know we went a little bit longer. Again, thank you to our fantastic presenters. And I hope to see many, many of you at the Pro Forum for our session uh, and uh, other opportunities. And Jennifer Peltier is just typing, us, say, typing to us saying, have a great day, everyone. And uh, we look forward to connecting more in the future. All right, enjoy the sunshine if it's sunny where you are. If it's not, hopefully it'll be sunny later. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.